you both. Thanks, God. Dearly beloved breath owner. <laughs> wrong show. <laughs> My name is Roy Hard and I'm an alcoholic. Oh no, that's the wrong show. <laughs> that reminds me, what a what a great title for a collection of anecdotes. Now everyone in show business has their own favourites, and when I think about it, the stories my fellow performers tell about each other is probably the reason I've stayed in the game for the past 40 years. You know. And now as I'm here on my Todd right now, I think I've had to find somewhere reminding myself of some of the stories. So I've dotted down just a few names that hopefully will spark off some memories for you. Now uh, I have to start by telling you how I came into show business in the first place, and I was brought up in. Croydon and I was brought up by my gran in Croydon and in my advice to any of you is if you're going to be brought up by anyone get brought up by your gran you know they're marvellous they're such a soft touch gran you know they're terrific. <laughs> and she was a terrific gran because uh, she brought the pair of us up on an old age pension which was about two pounds seventeen and sixpence in those days but she always found that every Tuesday night we had to go to the Croydon Empire she was a great fan of variety so we were always there every Tuesday night which was carnival night and that meant about three balloons came down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Some carnival, you know. The, and the manager used to stand on stage with a mirror and go round and the band used to play. <laughs> he'd stop, you know, and you'd get a box of dairy milk chocolate, you know, with that. <laughs> Never were we, we were always up in the gods and my grand's leaning over. Up here, mate, up here. <laughs> <laughs> Never got up that far. But I always remember that because the front of the, the sort of seats we sat in, in the gallery there, was they were whitewashed. And whenever we used to go out, just before we were going out into the street, my grand always used to say, turn round. I used to turn around, she'd go, and she'd wipe the whitewash off the back of her shoes like that. And she'd say, I don't want people knowing I can only afford the gods. <laughs> And we used to go. But she was a really lady, and she was a great fan of comedians. And one of her favourites of all time was Frankie Howard. You know, when he first sort of came round, and she always used to say, if a, a comic amused her, she used to say, "Ah, oh, he's a silly bugger." She used to say, <laughs> "I like him," you know. And it was a great place to see turns. You know, it was just after the war because we had a lot of the old music hall stars, and they were all together with a new wave of comics, people who had really nothing to do with the business, but all their sort of humour had been spawned by being in the forces and so you had on the bill people you'd have G.H. Elliot and Hetty King and Randolph Sutton you know on the bill with people like Max Bygraves and Harry Seacombe and I'll never forget seeing Harry Seacombe he did it which I thought was a terrifically original act at the Croydon Empire he did different people shaving you know <laughs> at different people shaving he went very well at Croydon it, it didn't go so well at Bury, apparently he told me because he was paid off after the first performance <laughs> and the money just said off you go you can shave in your own bloody time he said <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny how I'm sure a lot of you they say you can remember certain little jokes and certain lines that comics did all those years ago. And I always remember Harry Worth, who I thought was a terrific comic and a great variety act. And I always remember he used to come at the end of his act and he'd say, You've been marvellous, ladies and gentlemen. You really have. And, you know, the last time I played Croydon, he said, I came out of the stage door and there was a huge crowd waiting for me and they, they picked me up and they put me on their shoulders. And I said, are you taking me to the town hall? They said, no, you're for the river. <laughs> <laughs> They were great days, and there were some great original comedians. Spike, of course, Spike Milligan, Michael Benteen, and it, which reminds me again that um, I, I started doing shows in a boys' club, you know, and I, I joined this boys' club in Croydon, and you had to join... I wanted to play table tennis, and you had to sign for what they called an improving activity as well, you know. <laughs> and improving activities were very exciting things like leather work and metal work, you know, and car maintenance and all that, you know. I'm going down the sister, I thought, he said, you've got to pick one. You know, so I got it down. right at the bottom, concert party. And I thought, boy, that's me, you know. And I couldn't have been luckier because the chap who ran it, him and his wife, they'd both been pros for 40 years and they'd retired and they did the shows. And we always used to do a big charity show every year at Streatham Hill Theatre to raise money for the, for the club. And we always used to open up the boys in the concert party. He used to do about 10 minutes. And as I come off, the next turn on, and then he used to have hair out here and a great big beard, it was Michael Benteen. And he used to do the routine with the back of a chair, do you remember? And he used to sort of, it was a prison, then it was... Was a you know a road driller thing, and I was probably had a great big inner tube. 
He used to use in his act for no reason, and he picked up this inner tube, folded it in half, he said, Quick impression, Tessie O'Shea in full retreat. <laughs> <laughs> we, came, we came off from the thing, and Benting grabbed me just as he was going on, and he said, That was very funny, son, you know, you, know, you said you ought to do this for a living. And I never forgot it. And I, literally about 40 years later, I met Michael for the first time since then, you know. And I told him the story, he said, That's right, blame me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this dotting down of uh, headings might work here. It reminded me of a true story, so I, I thought I'd try a few alphabetically to write them down. Arthur Askey, of course. Now, Arthur, I had the great joy of working with him, Panto, and in a very odd way. I'd had a terrible year. Everything had gone wrong for me in this particular year. I was My first radio series didn't work out. First television series for ITV, that was no good. And I did a play at the Garrick with Rita Tushingman down in it. was around six nights, you know. <laughs> so it was looking very good at the beginning of that year. And I, I couldn't get arrested, as we say, you know. So I'm sitting at home there for about eight months out of work. My agent's ringing up and he's saying, oh, can't you give him a Sunday concert or anything, you know. And they're saying, no, no, he's box office poison and all that. Anyway, eventually Billy Marsh his famous um, you know, sort of manager and, and agent came on to my agent and he said, Would Roy be interested in doing Wimbledon for Chris? Would I? You know, I only lived down the road. I said, I can walk there, you know, marvellous, I'll be there. And it was with Arthur. And I only found out afterwards I'd never ever met Arthur in my life. I just admired him as, I think, one of the great innovators, really, of all time. And Arthur, they'd rung him about the pant out Wimbledon and he said, Yes, I would be happy to do it, but only if Roy Halley's in it as well because we work together marvellously in pantomime, we really do. And it would be a huge help to me. He knew I was in trouble and he got me the job. And people say in our business what mean people they are. Not really, eh? Not old Arthur, he was lovely. He started in concert parties as well, Arthur, of course, and he started on a bandstand in Cliftonville in Margate. And he said in those days, you know, they always dress up as the Pieros and everything. And sure a lot of you have read, even if you don't remember, but they used to have the bandstand shows and they'd say, if wet, in the town hall. <laughs> now Arthur said, we got nowhere to go if it was wet. If it was wet, we didn't play. You know, it was just this great big bandstand at Cliftonville. He said, so we start off, he said, and we get down there, June. He said, June's not bad. Now July, he said, it poured with rain for the whole of July and we hardly did a show he said now August the sun comes out and it's great he said and the guy who ran the show invented the one string fiddle for no reason at all he said and he's sitting up there and we're all in a line on the bandstand 3,000 people around the bandstand at Cliftonville he said and he's had a marvellous lunch the old boy who ran the concert party and he's nodded off in the afternoon there you know <laughs> And the soprano finished her first number tribute. And she said, now I'd like to sing for you, ladies and gentlemen, April was a lady. And he said, the old boy opened one eye and said, but July was a bastard. <laughs> You ever get the chance to read Arthur's life story is a terrific one. A story, I don't know if it's in the book or not, but one Arthur used to tell us was just after Dunkirk and he was in a big show in Blackpool, his own show, and uh, there was a military hospital in Preston and he took the whole show there one afternoon. That was the orchestra, the sets, the costumes, everything, and he did the whole show for the guys who were in this hospital. He's in Preston, his military hospital. And at the end of the show, the commandant said, oh, he said, Mr. Askey he said, wonderful of you to bring this terrific show to give up your afternoon off and Arthur said well nothing's too good for the lads who did what they did at Dunkirk and the commandant said Dunkirk he said the furthest they've ever been is Blackpool this lot he said this is the VD hospital <laughs> <laughs> go down the list again I had a bar, I broke down I had a bar here, I just remember seeing at the Met Edgware Road an, an old musical star who oh you beautiful doll was her big number, big hit number. And she, like all those lady stars, was a great big woman, you know. Huge she was, and she used to tell a story, sitting in her dressing room, and two blokes talking outside the dressing room in the street. And it was just before the second show started. One said, have you seen the show? He said, yeah. He said, what's it like? He said, not bad. He said, how about that Ida Bar? He said, Ida Bar? She could hide a bleeding brewery. <laughs> Billy Bennett, of course. You know, one of my great heroes, the man who invented the boom boom joke. Some girls were all right in a bath marble white, doused in perfume that's exotic. But the queen of my soul stands up in a bowl and does what she can with carbonic. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, yeah. oh, here's a name that always reminds me of lots of stories. Alan Breeze. Now, Alan Breeze, I'm sure. A lot of you remember old Breezy with uh, Billy Cotton's band show, you know. And the first television I ever did from London was the Billy Cotton band show. And I remember getting there, and I'd, I'd always been an admirer of, of Breezy, you know, because he could do everything. He could handle the comedy songs, the ballads, everything. And we got there, and there was two of us brand new, never been on the telly really before. And one was a, a Welsh singer, and we shared the dressing room. Alan said, come and share the dressing room with us. And at the end of it, he said to the Welsh singer, he said, I think you've got chances. It was Tom Jones. That was the first, <laughs> the first one. He said, oh, breezy, saucy devil. I think you've got chances, you know. But the great thing about Alan, which a lot of people don't know, he was a terrible stutterer, Alan. Now, this apparently does happen to a lot of people. When he sang... He could sing perfectly all right, you know, no problems at all. But when he actually spoke, he could not put two words together. It was murder. And he had a pub, you know, which the buck in it was called and Never Pass the Buck. He used to have one of the big... But, I mean, when you got there, it really was awful and he was serving people, you know. But it didn't worry him. But it was this terrible stutter. But once he started to sing, terrific. And he got done for speeding. See, so they bring him up, and he's going to fight the case, Alan, because he says, no, it wasn't speeding, you know. So he says, I'm going to go in the court, and I'm going to fight the case. Well, all the band weren't with him. They couldn't wait, you know, to see <laughs> what he was going to do, you know. So he gets there, and the judge said, well, tell me in your own words exactly what happened, Mr. Breeze. He said, well, I was g g going d d down the... M m oh, well, he goes, and they're all getting rested. He said, you're on ace. Could I possibly... Sing my evidence. <laughs> <laughs> the judge looks at me and said, Yeah, all right then. So he said, Take you. I was proceeding down the road at the seventeen miles an hour, went out of the same where he came and looked upon it, and off he went, you know. <laughs> the whole bloody thing, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, judge, case dismissed, I should think so too. That was breezy. I got Tommy Cooper written down, of course, brother Walter. Out. Tommy Cooper, I mean, there's classics of Tommy. I mean, the most famous one of all was him at the Royal Variety performance, saying to the Queen, you know, after the show. And she said, thank you very much, Mr Cooper. It was very nice. And so she walked away. And he did the unforgivable thing. He called her back, you know. <laughs> said, Mom. Uh, said, yeah. He said, uh, oh, forgive me. He said, but um, he said, are you interested in football at all? And she said, no. He said, can I have your cup final ticket? <laughs> And you talk, you talk to any taxi driver in London, they'll always say, I had that Tommy Cooper in here, you know. He said, he got out of the cab, put something in my top pocket, said, have a drink on me, tea bag. The tea bag. <laughs> Give it to everybody. We're D's now. Billy Dainty, my best friend. Billy Dainty. Yeah, a lovely guy. And we did a show together called Just a Verse and Chorus, just before old Billy knocked it on the head. But he was a dear... Dear chap, you know, and I always remember when, when Billy died, the letters I had from people, you know, who remembered him very well. And there was a lady who wrote to me, and I remember this happening so well. It was, he was doing a summer season at Torquay with Harry Worth, and Billy never failed, you know. He was, his act was absolutely fireproof. He was a terrific performer and all that. So he gets in, it's the opening night at Torquay, and he goes like a bomb, and he's sweating like a lunatic, you know, and all his dancing and everything, and he took his call like that, and he'd had a little piece made. He had a little bald patch in the middle there, Bill, and he had a little piece made, and as he took his call, it dropped off onto the stage. But it's and a hush went over the audience, and he leaned over, picked it up, looked at it, and he said, oh, well, you may as well know the lot, and took his teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good old Bill. <laughs> As you know, he was a marvellous dancer and he relied very much on all the, uh, the drums for his effects, you know, for all the, the eccentric dancing he used to do. And a great buddy of ours, another brother, Walter Rat, Len Lowe, was his straight man, you know, at one time. And they got, when they were playing the clubs, they got to one of these clubs and the fellow said, uh, can I have a word with the drummer? He said, we haven't got a drummer. <laughs> but he said, but I don't, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> so I've got to have the drums. He said, well, we haven't got any drums. So Len said, don't worry. And Len, well, the fellow played the piano, and Len played the drum part on his body. <laughs> <laughs> and he pulled in a storm, you know. I've got D Diggs I've got written down here, Diggs. Loads of stories about them, but my... My story about Diggs is really, it's a tragic story. <laughs> it was in a university town, which shall be nameless, because the lady involved is still around, I tell you. <laughs> I was doing a panto there with a pal of mine, and we got these digs, 
but it was all students, mostly, mostly, you know, during the year, but they were all gone away home, you know, for Christmas, so we had these digs. And we got in there, and it was right under the eaves, and we got out there, and an awful smell when we got out there in these digs. And my pal picked up the electric fire and ran it over these sheets, and they steamed, you know, it was horrible. <laughs> it was awful. And, yes, it was supper as well, we got supper as well. Every night when we came back from these rehearsals, baked beans... And that was all. That was all. Just a plate full of baked beans every night. So you must have had, from World War I, tins of this stuff up there. You know. but this was it, baked beans. So. And in those days, you know, no sort of real equity rules. You know, they didn't sort of say, you've got to finish after eight hours or anything like that. You used to actually go on and carry on rehearsals and lighting and things like that until you'd finished. And we were there, and it was about half past two in the morning. And it's the, they've finished the dress rehearsal, they've done all the lighting and everything. And me and Tom, my pal, were walking back to the digs and I've got the red mist now you know I'm saying if it's bloody baked beans I said they're going down that passage after her I tell you bloody baked beans you know so we get there that so we're here you know shuffle shuffle the old carpet slippers coming along the you know, thing two great big plates of bloody baked beans <laughs> look at this I've got the I've got me fork and I start poking about in there there's a sausage in it there's a sausage in the middle of these baked beans, you know. And I've, now I've really got the red mist and I say, Oi! I said down the corridor, there's something wrong here. I said, there's a sausage in the middle of these baked beans. She said, I know. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably still bloody letting them and still giving them baked beans. <laughs> I've got a name down here that may not mean much to a lot of you. It, uh, it was very well known in his day. It was a chap called Leslie Dwyer, you know. His last sort of thing, I suppose, was really, he was the miserable old Punch and Judy man. Yeah, in high the eye, you know. But he was in all those 40s and 50s films, you know, always as a cab driver. or He was sort of like the second string Gordon Harker, you know. <laughs> that was him. And uh, we were doing a play together on the road and... Uh, I'd never done much at all, really, you know, but we were in this play together, and we were in digs, and he said to me one night, he said, um, I'll tell you a fortune for you, if you like, you know. So I said, oh, OK, you know, and free, you know. <laughs> so, so we started talking, and he said, now, I'm going to write this down for you, so I'm going to write these letters down for you. He said, they're going to mean something to you. He said, N-S-M-A-P-M-A-W-O-L. That's going to mean something to you, very important. You know, I thought, OK. So I put it in my, in my wallet, this little slip of paper, and six months later, it's absolutely true, I did a first television programme that I'd ever done regularly, and it was called Not So Much A Programme, More A Way Of Life. And it was exactly the initial that Leslie had written. So there, spooky, eh? Spooky. <laughs> Spooky. The Gray story, well, you know, the name under G again, a classic name, Eddie Gray, Monsieur Eddie Gray, you know, the great man, the, the really the funniest man probably in the whole of the crazy gang. During the Second World War, they all went, uh, the crazy gang all went in a, two cars, you know, to entertain at one of these RAF camps, he said, and it's pitch black, you know, there was no lighting on or anything like that, he said, and we get to this RAF camp, they won't let us in. He said, and Chesley said, but it's the crazy gang. He said, yeah, 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 well, just a minute. And Eddie was in the car behind him, well, the window down, and he said, we have come for the plans of the Blenheim bomber. <laughs> and the policeman said, oh, let them in, that's the crazy gang. <laughs> Got another name. H written down here, Michael Harvey. Now, Michael Harvey was a chap who worked with me for about 10 or 15 years, Mike, and he was an old dancer in the West End shows, and he really knew everything there was possibly to know about show business, but he was terrific company. But the first time I ever did an impression of Max Miller was on the 50th anniversary of the RAF, and it was a show that we did live from the Victoria Palace, and we got there, and it was all people who'd been in the RAF for this 50th uh, anniversary. And we got, and one of the guys who was one of the compounds, it was Richard Burton. In the afternoon rehearsals, he comes in with Elizabeth Taylor, don't he? And they have a terrific row. And I remember banging through that door, you know, when you press the bar exit, bang, she goes through there. Not to be seen again, you know. And it comes to the show that night, and Burton's out there doing a bit of comparing, and he's standing in one of the boxes, and he's had a few, and there's two coppers. One's holding his right leg, and one's holding his left leg, and he's standing there in the box like this. <laughs> Then the Lord Tedder, and all this, you see. And he gets through that, and he's standing there in the line, and he's going like this, and we're waiting for the Duke to come. And he looks, 
<laughs> looked along the line, but he said, has anybody seen my wife? And Michael said, I'm not sure, what does she look like? <laughs> Earlier we were talking, I was saying about doing the impression of Max Miller and of course after being a terrific fan of Max's all, all my life, really because of my gran, you know, was a great fan of Max's and she would drag us to all the, you know, London music halls, variety theatres to see Max and I mean, you know, people say how dirty comic he was and all that, I mean I was about seven or eight and my gran used to take me there, she knew it would go over my head but she knew that I liked this man, you know, in his fantastic costume and the hat and everything and he was larger than life, you know, was a dangerous man, you know, great. So anyway, that's how we, we sort of got to know and Max, and then I did actually get the joy of working with him at Finsbury Park and Bar with G. H. Elliot and uh, Hetty King, and we were first on after the girls, um, the Mari De Vere dancers, and so on we go and we're doing our thing. And then about the Wednesday night, I look in the wings like that. We only did eight minutes, and Max is standing there watching us. You see, the great man himself. I can't believe it. So we come off, and he said, "Very good, that boy's very good." He said, "I like that Shakespeare bit you did at the end. Well, it was supposed to be a takeoff of Noel Coward, you know." But he said, "Shakespeare, lovely that was, you know." <laughs> so he said, "Boys, come on, I'll get you a drink." <laughs> ghastly hush, you know, all over the place. Because, I mean, this was Max's great thing. He never bought people a drink. It was, he was famous for it, you know, he really was. And like a lot of the comics, he came from a very, very poor background. And that's the reason why so many of them are mean, because they, they've never had any money. They've seen what their parents were, and they want to hang on to it, you know. And Max was worse than most. He, he hung on to it till his knuckles went white. You know? <laughs> so we said, well, I can't believe it. He says, come on, boys. So we go up to the circle bar, the show's still on, you know, and everything. And the two of us sat down there, me and Eddie, my partner, and he's talking about the business and all this, Max, and no sign of the hand going to the pocket at all. So I said, uh, I looked at Eddie and I said, well, uh, what would you like, Mr Miller? Have I asked you up here for a drink or not? <laughs> yeah, well, then sit down. You know, <laughs> so he goes on talking. Another 20 minutes. Eddie says, he says, what would you have, Mr Miller, please? <laughs> Boys, now I've asked you up for a drink. So we sit there, another ten minutes goes by, interval. And the bar doors open at the interval and all the audience come in. And the first one in says, there he is, says old Max. What will you have, Max? He said, I'll have a gin and tonic. What will you have, Roy? What will you have, Max? <laughs> He'd waited 45 minutes for that, you know, <laughs> rather than put his hand in his pocket, you know. <laughs> the classic Paddo story really is the Tom O'Connor one, you know, which I'm sure you may have heard, and it was Tom playing pantomime in his hometown in Liverpool, and they're doing the ghost gag, you know, if you see the ghost boys and girls, you will tell me, won't you, you know, so he's there, and they're all shouting out, he's back on you, he's behind you, he's behind you, you know, this and here, for this, no reason at all in this particular match, and it was a very posh boys' school in the front two rows of the stalls, and in the middle of all this chaos, there was a moment's silence, and, and this very posh boy said, don't shout anymore, Charles, the man's obviously an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> For the last 11 years of pantomime, I had the great joy of working all those 11 years with Jack Tripper, the greatest pantomime dame I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And one year, well, it wasn't when I was with Jack, but one year he was in panto with Ivan Owen, who's the chap who uh, works Basil Brush. And as you always did on the Monday, you sort of have a little get-together about an hour before the curtain went up and all discuss what you've been doing, you know, at the weekend and everything. And they're sitting there in the dressing room and uh, Ivan Owen he said, well, he said, a dreadful weekend. He said, I got back to the house, he said, and uh, we'd been burgled, broken into, he said. But, you know, he said, I searched from top to bottom of the house. They hadn't taken a single thing. And Jack said, how humiliating. <laughs> 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 I've only got down to the, uh, the ends, and I better knock it on the head now, because uh, this year... I'm delighted to tell you that I celebrate, well, myself and Chris Emmett particularly celebrate 25 years of Radio 2's news headlines, folks, at the end of the year. Yes, yeah, thank you. And Chris has been with it from day one. Because we were dead lucky in the early days, we had Janet Brown, you know, as our, as our comedian, you know, that did the greatest Margaret Thatcher of all time. And then following her, we had, for seven years, we had uh, Alison Steadman, who's, you know, become such a terrific uh, uh, actress and a wonderful film star. And so 
June Whitfield. This is how June came to get, be in the show. And uh, she's only been with it 14 years, you know, so... <laughs> she stands a chance, I think, you know, she's <laughs> one of the up-and-comers, you know. And we're doing, doing a panto we were in uh, Richmond. It was um, Dick Whittington, and I was hired with Jack. Jack was the first time I worked with Jack Tripp, was Sarah the cook. The fairy was June Whitfield. And we're, we're sitting there in the dressing room, and June and I got on very well, you know, and we're sitting in the dressing room one night, and she said, what are you doing when you finish here then? And I said, oh, we're doing some more headlines, you know. And I said, you know, it's terrible. I said, we, Janet's gone, I said, and Alison's become a film star now. I said, and we've tried every girl in radio, and we can't, no one seems to quite fit it. And June said, well, I've done a bit of radio, you know. I said, no, no. What about the old glums and all that, mate? I said, this is modern, this is, mate. I said, you know, I said this is satire, this is, isn't it? I said, you, I said, you've got to be able to do impressions and all that, June, you know. I said, I reckon you do Margaret Thatcher, you stand a bit of a chance, you know. She said, oh, you know. So the next matinee, we're in there, and she's got to referee the fight between the cat and the rat, you see. So we're all at the same like this. And she says, right, now go to your corners and come out fighting. <laughs> I said, June, you've got the job. <laughs> that was 14 years ago, so she's got it, you know. I had a great joy again of about three or four years ago of doing um, a version for television of P.G. Woodhouse's Heavy Weather. And, God, it was marvellous. And I played Beach the Butler as a gem of a part with Peter O'Toole, Richard Bryars, a terrific cast. And also in it was Richard Johnson, who's one of my very favourite actors of all time. And I can only tell you, it was a joy to be with people like Peter O'Toole because he is the brightest, most intelligent, greatest company in the world. And he loved the old variety stories like I've been telling you today, you know. So we got on like a house on fire. And Richard Johnson always used to sit there and never say, a word, just chuckle away at the jokes, you know. And he said, well, do you know, he said, I've only got one. He said, one that I can tell you. He said, uh, concerning my dear friend David Niven. Now, he said, David Niven had a sort of running gag. And when people used to say to him, tell me, uh, Dave, when he was making a film, what's the, uh, what's the new leading lady like? You know what I mean, Dave? <laughs> he always used to reply, the best lover I've had since Grace Kelly, he used to say. <laughs> So he's always got him out of trouble, you know. <laughs> so he said he would always do this. So he said he's now, Dave has been saying this line for years, and he's now in Monaco playing golf <laughs> with Prince Rainier, you see. And they're off around the course, and he's going to make this film. And he said, tell me, David, he said, what is the uh, new leading lady like? He said, the greatest lover I've had since Grace C. Fields. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me, folks. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>